Made with love by Indigro. Today we have Shweta Agarwal, the author of the book The Black Rose. She describes herself as an anti-colorism activist with a very colorful life. She is a dancer, um, I think a computer engineer by profession, if I'm not mistaken. Um, <laughs> but her passion is dance and writing. And she now has written a book called The Black Rose. But I'm going to stop here and uh, let Shweta tell us a little bit about herself. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much, firstly, for having me on your platform, Akila, on Indigro. I'm really, really grateful for the opportunity. Um, and I'm really grateful to have a chat with you to be able to spread my message about uh, colorism and raise awareness on, on the subject. So I started writing my book, The Black Rose, about two years, over two years ago now. Um, it kind of was triggered by the Black Lives Matter movement and George Floyd's murder. Um, having said that, there, there were, you know, many uh, occasions in life where we all fight colorism in our head, right? We, we know it's not right and we want to fight it. But unfortunately, the narrative is so deeply entrenched in our communities, in our society, in our mindset that, you know, fair is beautiful, that we kind of succumb at some point and we or we don't know how to fight it or we feel like we're powerless because there's only one of us. And if everybody's doing something, then it feels like. Actually, maybe it's not that wrong. So there's all that confusion that you go through, right? In your mind, especially as a child, teenager, impressionable years, all that. Um, so there were plenty of occasions that, you know, where I did feel like this is really unsettling. This is not right. Why should I have to do this? And why is only fair, uh, you know, beautiful? Um, and having said that, I think the last drop, as I described in my book, um, the last drop in my vessel of tolerance um, was... George Floyd's murder and the reason being that it got me thinking really hard about the prejudices that we hold as South Asians about the black community and anti-blackness um, because everything boils down to color right where the hierarchy that we see in our in our community that the caste system the classism uh, colorism everything boils down to your color and so the anti-blackness that South Asians generally, you know, hold um, the, the feelings of anti-blackness that they hold um, for the black community. Um, there was a lot of talk about that on, on a particular Facebook group. And that really hit me hard. And that's when I started penning my story. And, uh, and then I remember sitting on a park bench once and, uh, you know, writing a prologue. And my husband uh, immediately said to me, you have to write more. So I started writing it as a journal almost uh, kind of like for therapy for myself, as therapy for myself. Um, but then I think it kind of, something changed in me where I found the courage to write it as a story, to be able to share it with other people. And what brought that change was my husband and my kids. And they said, you have to write this so that other people can benefit from this. And you have to write it in such a way. And so, I started doing that. It's been the most cathartic thing I've ever done in my life. I am so grateful to be receiving amazing feedback for the book because I've been brutally honest in it. Um, it's full of confessions. It's, it's for the, the thought process that a little child from the age of six to all the way to a 45 year old woman goes through. And you know what brought me here, what brought me to the stage of succumbing to skin whitening products for decades and decades um, so, yeah, I'm really, really happy uh, to share my story with other people. I feel like I'm making a difference and um, there's no better work in the world than that, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm listening to you talk and you can feel the the passion, but can I also say you feel the pain, right? And 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 it comes through so clearly. And um, one of the things that, uh, you know, from what you've talked about about the book is that it is almost like an autobiographical kind of uh, book in the sense that you know there you have drawn a lot about your own childhood experiences and your own mm -hmm. journey of navigating life uh, from the lens of colorism and uh, is there something that you would like to kind of share with us uh, about your childhood you know any incidents that kind of stood out or mm -hmm. things that made you kind of really notice colorism uh, conversations that were happening around you yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, there's, there isn't anything that I haven't shared in the book, so I'm more than happy to share. Um, so firstly, let me just begin by saying that when I started writing and when I started uh, putting myself out there on social media and even till date, 
the number of times I get people responding to my messages or my, you know, or my posts and commenting saying, but you're not even that dark. <laughs> so it's like become the second story of my life, you know, having to justify why I went through what I went through and the fact that I did, you know, having to validate my story. So as a child, I'm, I'm almost having to validate that and justify this. Um, as a child, I was a lot darker, significantly darker than my parents. And my parents, I mean, they're like as fair as Indians could get, really. I call it the ferometer in my book. And my father was like number one, Gora Chitta, as they say in Punjabi language, right? Uh, although we're not Punjabi, but, you know, that's the, the color he had. My mother was very fair. My brother's very fair. So I was like the black sheep in the family for my color. Um, so as a six-year-old, to have been enrolled in boarding school when my parents moved to Japan, and, you know, there were reasons, of course, and I've explained that all in the book. You can imagine the sense of abandonment a child goes through, right, at the age of six. Um, and we're talking back in the 1980s where you can't do FaceTime. You can't send, you know, presents like international delivery arriving the next day, you know, or like, you know, big teddy bears and hugs and cuddles and all that, right? You can't, yeah? Yeah. So I only saw my parents once a year um, for the six week summer term break. And that was it. Um, and that happened for two and a half years. So during that time to then be told as a child by somebody in the extended family that my parents left me behind because they're ashamed of my color. That is childhood trauma. Yeah, that is. Right. So that st stuck with me. And from that day on, I started seeing color in people. I started that I started from that day on, the first thing I started seeing in people was their color. Yeah. And it shouldn't be that way, right? Because I was so painfully reminded, mercilessly reminded of my color uh, at the age of six, that that was the first thing I would notice in other people. And I would notice like, oh, she's so fair and she's so beautiful. Yeah. I'm not as fair as her, so I'm not as pretty. Yeah, these sort of things started popping in my head. And it wasn't just that. I mean, it, that was relentless. This one particular uncle, he was just relentless with his comments. Um, I don't know what pleasure he got out of it, you know, troubling a little child. But unfortunately, there are people like that. I've even heard of other people's stories, same similar sort of tones, you know, uh, being uh, kind of targeted towards them. They picked you up from a dumpster. Yeah, or you don't belong, you know, things like that. Um, unfortunately, with South Asians, when it comes to these sort of things, there's no filter, there's no tact. <laughs> and there's shockingly, in my case, there was no filter even towards a child. Yeah. So that's just one anecdote that I can share. I mean, after that, it's just kind of, you know, uh, it goes on and on and on, even during my school um, years when I moved to Japan, same thing. Essentially, all my life, wherever I went with my parents, people would express surprise that I was their daughter. Yeah. So it it gets to you, right? Um, 100%. You know, um, one of the things that you kind of mentioned at the start of uh, this, you were talking about idea that people were surprised, uh, you know, oh, but you're, you know, as an adult, oh, but you're not so dark, right, anymore. Or you mentioned this ferrometer idea that uh, South Asian context or any kind of uh, cultural mm -hmm. context, right, you have this, like, from light skin to darker skin, etc. Mm -hmm. Scale of it. Um, on the flip side of it, just to give you uh you know, an, another story to add to your books. I remember that when I was a child and I was uh, three or four years old. Um, so my mom is a, a shade darker than me or, you know, a couple of shades darker than me. And I was very fair or, you know, right. like, like you said, the Gori Chitti. I remember being told by people that, oh, you know, it was it was flipped, right? It was said, mm. oh, she's so fair when you're so dark. And as a three or a four year old, I remember feeling that I don't belong to my mother. And that's terrible. And that's terrible, right? Again, you it's know, a for a child, it's their whole world. Exactly. Belonging. Belonging. You know, that sense of belonging. Exactly. It's their exactly. whole world. That comes crumbling down, Absolutely. crashing your entire world. Absolutely. So I'm I, so sorry you had to hear that. Yeah, but I, I think that, you know, this, and this is what you were talking about, this idea that, you know, um, exists, mm. you know, Unfortunately, whether it's passed down because of our colonial ancestry, you know, this this idea of, you know, fair being more privilege, more power, more 
etc etc um mm -hmm. it is at some level i think in every south asian uh you know uh, and we we'll stick to south asian families at this point for for you mm -hmm. know so this conversation it is intrinsic right it's almost like conditioned into our thought processes 100%. and uh, it's it's accepted it's accepted it's ac accepted it's normalized exactly exactly yeah. you know children who are growing up you know and whether it was us in the 80s or whether it's even our children today i mean you know let's be honest the fairness creams still exist mm -hmm. it's the fastest growing market you know yeah, it is skin care uh mm -hmm. if you if you if you open uh you know um uh, marriage uh, matrimonial section uh, fair and you know slim and pretty it's all kind yeah. of five criteria wanted one of them will be fair bride yeah right and that is the world that unfortunately our children are still kind of being raised in you know mm -hmm. so and the thing is that i don't know uh, and this is where i was hoping that you might be able to throw some light on the topic is that it is a very uncomfortable topic for some reason mm -hmm. are hesitant to talk mm -hmm. about their experiences mm -hmm. you know it 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 almost feels like it happens to other people you know it takes a lot of courage and a lot of uh, you know being comfortable to express vulnerability to say yes it has impacted me mm. have you ever kind of seen that in your conversations absolutely over and over and over again the number of times that i get dms from people saying you don't know what your page has done for me i've been through this i've been through that myself and then i'll ask them i'm so sorry to hear this but your story is really powerful can i share it on my page and then they'll say oh no no can you you know please don't share it um i respect that i get that um it it takes a lot of um strength and at some point everybody comes to that stage themselves that point where they want to heal and they just don't care anymore what other people will think so i came to that point 2 years ago but that doesn't mean that everybody comes to that point at the same time and that's what i'm trying to do with my page and my cause um to raise awareness and get people to come to that point quicker and sooner yeah um I think the reason why people hesitate to talk about it is because as I said earlier it's so normalized. Yeah. So it's like if you say something ah what do you mean that what's wrong with you using you know fairness creams we're only helping you it'll improve your color. Yeah forget normalized they think they're they're actually helping you by suggesting ways to lighten your skin don't go out in the sun apply basin and whatever you know apply these fairness creams. Well it's so normalized that you feel like you just zip it and you can't say anything yeah. body shaming generally i think not just colorism but body shaming is so normalized in our south asian culture you know the first thing that you hear aunties say on a skype call right back then there was skype <laughs> and, um is kitni kali ho gayi yeah or thodi moti nahi ho gayi you know haven't you put on some weight haven't you lost some weight haven't you like you've turned dark or you, i mean that's the first thing they say to you on your face not even a hello you know and that body shaming is so normalized that you feel like who do you share with and i think that's why people are turning to these social media platforms and these pages because that's their outlet for them and slowly i'm seeing that i'm making a difference because people are now starting to say yes please share yeah. and and by the way you can tag me yeah um when i uh, had my book launch the most touching thing during the entire book launch well there were two there's another story but i'll share this one first <laughs> um the the one of the most touching things that happened was firstly there were quite a lot of men in the book launch which was really amazing to see like male support there right because let's be very honest men are affected by colorism but it's women like for for them it's tenfold because the pressure is tenfold um, these two men came up to me and they shared their stories with me and they said when i was you know 10 and i was called kario so he's gujarati so he kario in a garba and he said by my uncle you know and i didn't even know what to do and i didn't even know what to say and because i was a boy and i'm supposed to be strong i couldn't even cry because i was so even though i was so upset 
that I didn't want to be called that. And so I laughed. That's what people do. You end up laughing at yourself because everybody else is laughing at you. So you don't know how to react. And so you laugh at yourself. And that's, you think that, oh, by laughing at yourself, like, I'll be fine. Yeah, just brush it off. I'll be fine. But you're not fine. It hurts. And that's what I want people to understand from reading my book. The, the, the ones who kind of perpetuate colorism, the perpetrators who, you know, have no qualms in saying such taunts to other people. I want them to understand that it hurts. This, these are not just casual words. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the thing is, I think one of the other things that, uh, you know, when we talk about colorism is that you know, even if we are, say, um, you know, a little bit more uh, aware and enlightened and we're mm-hmm. taking the steps to uh, avoid, you know, like maybe today you might not actually have somebody who goes and says, oh, he's black or she's black or, you know, uh, or he's, he's she's dark and, you know, actually making those outright statements to somebody's mm-hmm. face. Um, mm. There is still a lot of implicit kind of negative uh, connotations, right? Whether it's in mm-hmm. the environment, uh, you know, I mean, it's 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 as simple as you know, at at a, in schools for plays, you'll find you know the fairer child always being chosen to perform in front of yeah. you know other yeah. kids, or you know, there there is this imp- what what we call implicit bias. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, and mm. uh, you know, whether you're an adult or you're a kid. I mean, each one of us, we we recognize implicit bias when we see it. We may not be able to immediately point it out, mm. but it it is felt and it does impact. Yeah. Is there is there any times where you felt that implicit bias in your life? Um, I think for me it was very explicit. <laughs> I felt it very explicitly. I was told by people around me very explicitly. The implicit bias, I guess, was when one aunt, well, it's not really implicit, even this is explicit. She told me very, very blatantly, point blank, that I wanted to be a Bollywood dancer, Bollywood actress. Um, when I was a child, you know, I've been dancing since the age of six. And it's the, one of the things that literally makes me come alive um, till date. And six, as a six year old, again, I was told, uh, you know, uh, what's what what use is all this? It's not like you can become a Bollywood actress. And I was like, huh? Why not? Just looking at her blankly. Um, and she said, um, well, don't you know, there's only Godi actresses in Bollywood. Okay? Well, that's the end of a career path right there. <laughs> Crash, right? Um, yeah. You grow up, if you're not light enough, you basically grow up believing, I don't qualify. Yeah. Yeah. For everything. I don't qualify for this career. I don't qualify to be a bride for somebody. I don't qualify to, uh, you know, to want to... Uh, achieve higher education. Um, I don't qualify to uh, be put forward uh, for a client facing role, like air hostesses, for example, right? You don't see very many air hostesses that are dark or hotel uh, receptionists, for example, yeah? Um, you don't. You certainly don't see that in Bollywood or in any Indian media. I mean, I went to India just recently in December, three years later, uh, since 2019, and you know, I saw color, rampant colorism even in 2019. and nothing's changed nothing yeah from the time you land you know to like a lady advertising a pressure cooker to a lady advertising a car you know they're all fair skinned no and even um, if even if they are darker skinned in real life they you know it's the filters and the photoshopping that is is you know yeah. very clearly uh you know apparent um so the thing that i guess that my question then is that so we know that colorism is rampant in society Right. Mm -hmm. We know that people are hesitant to address it or hesitant to, um, you know, combat it in some ways. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we're also raising children with such awareness. We're raising children and we would ideally not want to kind of repeat the Mm -hmm. same cycle. You know, the, 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 the true growth in generation after generation is when we are able to break away from the cycles. Right. Uh, So Mm -hmm. how do you see the role of colorism or these conversations that we are having for children Mm -hmm. and for the next generation and for us as parents? How 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 does how do you see that changing for our children? So I think we have to make a very conscious, very obvious effort um, to constantly instill uh, this in our children uh, that 
only fair is not beautiful. Dark is also beautiful. All shades are beautiful. We are all beautiful. Little examples that I can give you. Um, you see a massive billboard, yeah, of uh, glow and lovely now. <laughs> and if you see it and you see your child looking at it, immediately call it out and tell your child, you know, that that is not good. That is not right. Yeah. You are beautiful exactly the way you are. You do not need to use such products. Yeah. Yeah. Immediately call it out when you're with, with your child and you go to a cosmetic store and you see, it, and again, another cream that says brightening. Because right now, fair and whitening is not allowed. Yeah. Um, so they are using this new, you know, it's a euphemism, right? Like brightening, whatever. We know what it means. Can you find it's every synonym in the thesaurus? Exactly, right? It's the same thing. And you, you call it out. You tell them, this actually just means this. You know, there's no reason for you to lighten your skin. Explain the advantages of having more melanin in your body. Yeah. Why it is good for you. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about like, you know, kids as young as two, three, whatever, you know, your brown skin sparkles. Give them compliments if they're dark. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, parents also very, um, I don't think they realize, but they're, they often end up having um, this conscious, subconscious bias between their own kids when one is lighter than the other. Yeah. Yeah. And the compliments go towards a lighter one more, more often than not. So they have to make a conscious effort of not doing that. Yeah. You know, even simple things like, oh, tujh pe to sab rang achhe lagte hai, because you're lighter, right? Um, so you look good in any color, yeah? Uh, as opposed to the darker one, like, no, I think, I think you should only wear this. This doesn't look right on you. I mean, that itself is a very explicit message you're sending to your children, Absolutely. yeah? You can't wear a particular color because you're a particular shade. Doesn't work. Yeah, like yeah. So if your child comes running up and say, I want to wear a black dress, yeah, go for it. You're, that looks beautiful on you. You know, can I wear red lipstick? Yeah, go for it. You know, it looks amazing on you. So all these little things make a huge difference. And the second thing that I think we need to start seeing now is we really need to see representation in media. Yeah. Because when you see yourself, we all talk about this as like a book, you know, authors and, you know, in terms of diversity and encouraging diversity, inclusion, all that. It all boils down to you being able to see yourself in media. And media is a very powerful tool. Whether we like it or not, it literally influences our life from the day, from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, right? And it's probably the biggest influencer of our lives now. Yeah, 100%. So we, we need to see representation in media. 100%. Uh, one of the things that, you know, you were talking about, and I think that rings home very true to us at Indigo as well, is this idea of opportunity, right? And seizing every single opportunity and, uh, you know, not waiting for a suitable moment uh, message because uh, life is lived every mm -hmm. day. You know, conversations yeah. happen every day and yeah. impact is felt every day. You know, nobody took you aside to kind of pass a comment. They just said it, you know. That's it. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> so, so how do we kind of, um, you know, make it part of everyday conversation where you're constantly reinforcing this message, right? Reinforcing, right. powering your children on a daily basis. I, I don't know if you've seen, but what we came out with this book, The Colors of India. I did. It's so did beautiful. You know? I love it. Okay. Absolutely love it. <laughs> yeah. So this one, I mean, so it, uh, the way you've written a book for adults, for us, it was about writing for the child, right? And it's exactly yes. the same thing. It's about this little black crow who doesn't crow. want to be... Yeah black because he doesn't like the color and the, for us that we did at the end of the book and it's something that you touched upon as well uh this idea of making melon a more mm -hmm. prominent word and part of everybody's vocabulary right i think mm -hmm. Uh, this idea that we all have melanin in us and melanin actually protects us from the sun and it does you know so we've actually given it a little cape and called it a superhero because that's exactly what it does it protects you from uh -huh. the sun. you know the more melanin yeah. you have the darker the color of your skin right yeah. and so it's a good thing yeah. and uh, that's that's an easy scientific concept for children to pick up I think that the messaging that there's no judgment you know whether positive or negative in either way it just is some people have more melanin and some people have less and that's, that's it. it i think that that can kind of change conversation it can change the mm -hmm. way like you said children see themselves the way they see other people uh and then when representation happens it helps to kind of 
cement that fact as well. One of the things that I was wondering about, especially uh, given, you know, so we've been talking a lot about it from a South Asian perspective and colorism within the South Asian context. Mm -hmm. There's also the broader race angle, you know, especially those who are living uh, in the UK or in the US, you know, there's a lot of different forms, right? Colorism, a lot of the times, of course, it happens across races, but it also happens mm -hmm. internally within uh, particular ethnicities, right? Within your own mm -hmm. immigrant community, there will be, you know, uh, colorism that takes place. So how do you see it kind of um, against each other, you know, when, because of the other conversations that have come up is that, you know, colorism is something that's it's a lesser than we need to talk about racism at this point and you know we we'll, once we've dealt with racism then we'll get to colorism so how do you feel about that i would completely disagree um because you know this just like they say charity begins at home yeah. change begins here yeah. yeah yeah and colorism comes from here because you're on that uh narrative yeah. that fair is beautiful and fair fair is supreme in, in every sense it's not just about beauty right yeah. perceptions of colorism are fair is beautiful fair is rich fair is most likely better educated uh fair is most likely more just intelligent you know sign of intelligence uh if, if you're darker you're probably labor class blah 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 it comes from casteism it comes from classism so it's not just the colonial um uh influence right the, there are other inf uh, influences as well so we can't really just blame colonization for colorism the, it exacerbated it but it was there in india for for a very long time very very long time I mean, the whole caste system is called the Varna system. Varna in Sanskrit means color. Yeah. I'm no, you know, scholar, but surely Varna didn't mean at that time red, blue, yellow, and green. <laughs> so, you know, it's just, it's a ludicrous notion, right? A uh, social construct. Um, so 100%, I think when people talk about colorism, I think they need to realize also that they're not just talking about colorism. They're talking about the combination of social constructs, colorism, casteism, and classism. You can't separate the three. Yeah. Yeah. Because the other two come along with it. Yeah. Because of your mindset. You look at somebody who's darker, she must be from a lower class. She must, or he must be from a labor class, working in, you know, the fields, blah, blah, blah. So you can't separate them. So when you put the three things together, that is an extremely powerful social construct that you need to fight against. Yeah. I've been posting a lot about this on my social media platforms as well. Like, wake up, South Asians, start looking here first. You know, there's no, you can't be pointing fingers at other people. Can't be saying, you know, oh, I want to fight, you know, systemic racism. And, you know, how can you tell me not to fight racism? Well, I'm like, well, I didn't say you can't fight it. All I'm saying is, I don't think you have the right to fight it if you're not fighting colorism and you're not fighting social uh, unconscious biases that you hold against people in your own community. Well, not even unconscious, very conscious bias. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, if you can't treat your own people right, I don't think you have the right to call out racism and, and, and tell other people, how dare you not treat me right? That's my personal view. You know, it's, for me, it's very black and white. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of work for us to do as South Asians before we start touching upon racism. So I completely disagree with people saying, oh, well, racism is a bigger problem and yeah. we need to fight that. Um, because once we start fighting colorism, classism, and casteism ourselves, we will become more confident. Yes. And literally, like, you know, can't touch us. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I think that uh, on that note, I think that, you know, one of the things that you can do to address the whole conversation behind colorism is mm. to read the Black Rose. Um, so... You know, uh, Shweta, if you want to kind of show people the copy uh, that you have. Thank you. That's so sweet. Thank you very much. <laughs> so this is um, my memoir that I have written. It's called The Black Rose. There's a very um, profound reason for the title. So it's kind of like chapter nine in the book. And you'll find out why it's called The Black Rose. Um, and it's my real story. I've written it from, you know, first person perspective. And it's literally my story. Um, and I think that there's some power in that because as my own story I have people approaching me and sharing their stories and I don't think that they would be able to relate if I created a, a, as a you know if I wrote it as a fictional character as much maybe but because there's a living person right in front of them who's written the story they find some they, they're, they're able to find the courage to then approach me to share their stories um, and I think there's a lot to be said about 
uh, vulnerability, as, as you mentioned earlier, uh, it's not a weakness, it's a strength. It's a strength because the one thing I have realized from being on social media, from sharing my story, is that, you know, we South Asians, I mean, literally, we are living under the sphere of what will people think, right? My take on that is completely different because I have now started thinking, well, not what will people think, I know they're thinking the same thing. They're just afraid to voice it, yeah? So that there's a lot of power in that. And if we all come together, I really, really feel that we can fight colorism and you know, to the point at least that we will make people think twice before they come up with things like, oh, you've turned dark or, you know, oh, don't go out in the sun, you'll turn dark or, you know, kali kaluti bang and luti, right? I mean, that's such a horrible phrase, right? Like, you you know, black like an aubergine or black like a crow. Um, you know, the, these words, they are unacceptable and they hurt. And my plea to you all listening is please change your language because words matter the most in driving change and bringing change and children are like sponges they absorb everything and when something sticks it sticks and then hopefully and fortunately now South Asians have finally started understanding how important it is to look after your mental health so please think about the mental health angle because if a child grows up believing that they're inadequate and they have low self-esteem, you can imagine when they grow up, what will what that will do to their mental health. Um, it can lead to depression. It can lead to much worse things. So if anything, for the health of your child and your family going forward, start thinking about the mental health angle when it comes to talking about colorism and your words. Be, you know, be careful with what you say. Thank you so much, Shweta. That was really, really lovely. And for those of you who are watching, uh, we will link uh, Shweta's uh, website as well as where you can pick up the Black Rose in this video. And uh, I just want to take the opportunity to say thank you so much for having written such a powerful book. And I know that it will impact so many people out there. And um, I just wish you all the best uh, for all your future endeavors. And uh, thank you for sharing your voice with us. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this video. Visit us at integralkids.com for more.